Okay, we'll move on to Virginia Hammond introducing Kristen Desson. Um, go ahead, or I think we're ready now. We'll get you on the screen. All right, I I'm ready. I am thrilled to introduce the very distinguished Christine Desson. She is the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law at Harvard University. She teaches about the political economy of capitalism, constitutional th history, and legal theory. She's the founder and managing editor of JustMoney.org, a website that explores money as a critical site of governance. She co-founded Harvard's program on the study of capitalism and interdisciplinary project. She's on the steering committee of the Massachusetts Public Banking and more and more and more. I was first introduced to Professor Desan at the 2019 Democratizing Money Conference in Boston, where Stephen and I were fortunate to sit at her table at one of the dinners. I was inspired to have read her excellent book, uh, Making Money, Coin, Currency, and the Coming of Capitalism, and the paper she will present today. My copies of her work are full of highlighting comments and exclamation points. She has enriched my understanding of the money issue, and it's exciting to have you here sharing your perspective and deep knowledge and understanding of the money issue with us. So welcome, Professor Desan. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm honored to be invited. Uh, I actually will start by saying that we are finally going to have a second Money as a Democratic Medium conference this June 2023. So it will actually, since it was December 2018, it's yeah. a fifth year anniversary of, um, of Money as a Democratic Medium. And we hope to have the same spirit and interesting exchange that we had at that meeting. So please put it on your radars. It's not, uh, we haven't officially published the call for papers, but we will in the near future. So uh, I would like to share my screen. I also have a PowerPoint. So if it's possible to get permission to share my screen, I would do that. that you should uh, have uh, ability okay. to do the learning. So there we go. So that should, let's see if I can, is that showing up the whole, does that read correctly or do we have more than one slide at a time there? There are two yeah. slides. All right. How about that? One. Good. Okay. Okay. Super. Um, well, uh, as I said, thank you very much. I'll just dive right in uh, to give um a version of the paper and hope to pick out its highlights. A year into the COVID drama, Jenna Smilek presented, uh, published a piece in the New York Times called The Financial Crisis the World Forgot. Uh, as she put it there, the 2020 meltdown echoed the 2008 crisis in seriousness and complexity. But where the housing crisis and ensuing crash took years to unfold, the coronavirus panic had struck in weeks. The disruption in the markets followed, so the Fed rolled out one rescue program after another, programs aimed at banks, shadow banks, uh, each borrower in the capital market, market that was large uh, to employ many people. As she concludes, the Fed's 2008 rescue effort had been widely criticized as a bank bailout. The 2020 redux was to rescue everything. The effects were redistributive in complex ways, as you all know from watching, uh, from watching and being tuned into these issues. And yet, as she also points out, you are the exception. The, the, this astonishing outlay of governmental effort and expenditure was followed by nothing, really. No public outcry, no public reaction. That was the gist, the point of her newspaper article to say how neglected the uh, whole event had been. In my view, Smilex article exposes a serious problem for those of us interested in a democratic monetary system. First, there's little to no popular knowledge about how our monetary system works. No sense that the monetary hardwiring defines the way money, money and credit travel and to whom they travel. No sense that it has, the monetary hardwiring has a profound impact on the way we conduct exchange and the way we distribute wealth. No sense either that the hardwiring could be changed. Second problem made clear by the article, the way the system has developed has obscured or eluded 
um, elided justification. So again, as the COVID crisis made clear, um, that crisis is forgotten. There's no discourse that adequately justifies the way money was spent there. The same is true when financial crisis or insofar as financial crises are categorized as a matter for experts to decipher. Again, that means that they elude justification and examination at a democratic level. But more, the paper argues, as you, as you know, that in many ways, our monetary hardwiring, the elemental delegation to banks has never been vetted. Third, the third problem, it's very difficult to get outside the current hardwiring. That is, it's really hard to spend even public spending, um, except in ways that reinforce the monetary architecture that we have, the financial infrastructure, and, that, um, and those ways of spending actually expand the monetary architecture, the financial infrastructure. Again, the COVID crisis illustrated, exemplified that problem. The article's agenda is to address each of these problems. Uh, first, the article draws a map. This is really just a project in, um, aimed at uh, the average sort of uh, um, audience with some level of education, you know, that can read this, um, this and engage this seriously. It flags, this part of the paper flags uh, money design as novel. So most people do not realize that 300 years ago, governments revolutionized the way they produced money. They delegated money creation to private actors, to banks, and institutionalized banks as the agents in charge of producing our daily medium. They institutionalized banks as the actors who would diffuse the sovereign or official money into circulation. Uh, so that public delegation was made over time and de facto, not by the way, by legislative um, decision, at best, I would say, by legislative neglect. The paper then in this still Christine, mapping- we're still on your first slide. That's that fine. I yeah, okay. that's fine. Not changed yet. Uh, I don't have too many illustrations, just a few. Sure. Um, the paper zooms out in this mapping uh, moment uh, to unpack the structural role of retail banks and considers the way their money creative privilege works. It argues that there's, it has a large distributive impact, as you know. Second, the second aim of the paper is to problematize the delegation to banks. If money creation is publicly enabled and is consequential, then it requires justification. But that justification is lacking in my view. When we look to the history to figure out uh, how banking ascended to such an important privilege, the history fails to, to provide justification. We can locate the way banks gained their privilege, but that narrative does not suggest that banks are singularly well equipped uh, or deserving of the privilege. When we look to the theory used to justify the preeminent position of banks, it also fails. It neglects the defining capacity of modern retail banks, which is money creation. It casts banks instead as the evolution of medieval techniques of finance, so of mercantile cross-border uh, money lending. All this occurs without real scrutiny of alternative designs for money's creation and distribution. Third, the paper makes a reform proposal. Uh, it argues that we should add direct issue dollars to our monetary repertoire. Direct issue dollars are a way of spending outside finance, or at least chipping away at the monopoly of finance. So it's a very incremental, small scale reform. Um, the idea is that direct issue dollars would be a direct legislative outlay of credit, transparently tax anticipation dollars. Those could operate with great remedial effect in recessionary times like monetary finance. So both monetary finance and direct issue dollars operate without enlarging the amount of long-term public debt. Um, but direct issue dollars would be better than monetary finance insofar as they would be spent by politically accountable actors targeted to populations which could use them best, transparent in their link to, to taxation and to the public fisc and generative, we could hope of other modes of money creation um, that respond to private needs while remaining democratically accountable. So I thought what I'd do is just spend a few minutes on each of these aims of the paper. Um, and here we do get to the, to the PowerPoint. 
so first, the first aim of the paper, which is to um, expose the monetary hardwiring and map it, the paper uses the COVID spring of 2020 to, um, to reveal the striking pattern of federal spending. This uh, COVID spending ball shows the way spending stood in August 2020. Uh, and the most arresting aspect, I think, of the image is the Fed spending, right? The teal colored spending. Uh, let's look at the Fed then and look at the amount it's spending here. The Fed does not spend to small players. So the Fed supports commercial banks, it buys bonds from investors, it irrigates the capital markets by supporting financial activity of broker dealers, it supports capital debt markets. When it stretches furthest, as in this crisis, it lends to large businesses, big corporate players, states and municipalities. So the spending total conservatively estimated that was allocated or available to the Fed was three to six trillion dollars. Trillion, that's with a T. Um, uh, significantly exceeding the annual federal budget. Over the next 20 months, the Fed would indeed spend about $5.2 trillion. Why does it spend so much during the crisis? Because as you know, it maintains our financial infrastructure. Our political economy is a system that operates by ceding money creation to private actors, to commercial banks, uh, and for that matter, to shadow banks. As I just mentioned, in a capitalist system, private actors make the blood supply the medium of the economy, and they do that by allocating credit in money. So the paper follows uh, in this mapping uh, task or aim the hardwiring to focus on commercial banks, given the um, enormously important role they play, banks have a structural advantage that makes them the money providers in a society, the retailers of liquidity. That structural advantage is the capacity to expand the money supply as they lend. That is, uh, banks are making new money as they lend and making new money is a public function. So here we can see just on the face of the dollar that the government has agreed to take back the dollar. It's true legally that, uh, that the dollar is a sovereign liability. It's true historically. We can talk about that if, if you're interested. Um, if money is a sovereign liability as is clear legally and historically, then expanding it is a sovereign function. The government appoints banks, however, to act for the public insofar as the government, uh, the federal government assimilates banks into its monetary architecture. And this is just a schema that I use. It's really more accurate for the English systems. Like, you know, the, the, the Fed is a little bit different, which is why this says central bank instead of, um, instead of Federal Reserve. But the basic idea is correct, right? The, the schema shows how um, money in the modern systems are made by banks, by either the central bank monetizing a government bond, a government IOU, a longer term IOU, or by commercial banks issuing private credit deposits in return for, um, for private IOUs to them. Uh, so having located uh, the banked medium, banked uh, money creation as a public delegation, the paper then takes a closer look as, at exactly how banks create money. And uh, this will sound very familiar, I think, to many of you. Banks lend in a particular way. Uh, they extend credit in uh, private promises to pay the sovereign's money as needed. They set off those promises against the promises of other banks. That is, they literally settle those promises with a far smaller, their own private promises, reciprocally with a far smaller amount of sovereign money, their reserve. And that settlement, is supported by the government. That method of, uh, let's see, hmm, hopefully that won't interfere. Um, the method of lending is extremely low cost. So banks lend with their own promises uh, of money. They can lend for less therefore than other lenders who don't have access to that method. And indeed, they can pass on that advantage. So those borrowing from banks borrow from for less often than those borrowing elsewhere. 
We can see that empirically. And the result is that banks entrench themselves as the main lenders in a society. They diffuse money into circulation. And given their dominance in that role, they determine distribution as they do that. So obtaining a bank loan is often the critical ingredient for success across a range of economic initiatives, homeowning, uh, starting a business, surviving a health crisis. So we need banks, uh, the average American, and that pattern of lending uh, is highly selective. Indeed, banks do not claim to lend according to public criteria that would reach all people. Instead, they're claiming they're lending according to a private criteria of profit. Um, so the, the results are indeed selective. Banks leave aside routinely all kinds of borrowers. We see disparities by region, by wealth, by color, by gender, lots of work here that makes this very clear. I recently talked to a student who was working on um, early unionization. It turns out that banks in the early 20th century declined as a matter of policy supported by the ABA to, to lend to employers who had unionized shops. Um, so, you know, they're, they're discriminating against union status. Banks need not defend the notion that they lend according to a private calculus of profit. That's their business model. But here we return to the public, right? It, uh, the point that banking is a public delegation. A democratic society does need to justify its delegation of a public, uh, a public function to actors who lend on a private criteria, a criterion as opposed to a public one. So that leads me to the second aim of the paper, which is to problematize the current architecture. Having mapped it, I hope sufficiently so that it becomes um, legible to people who are not particularly knowledgeable about the architecture. Then we look at the, um, the problem posed by the architecture. Retail banking poses this issue. How do we justify the current allocation of authority? An allocation made kind of over time, um, incrementally. What explains why increases increases in a public medium should be distributed by commercial actors operating for private profit? That allocation is, after all, facially discriminatory. So I would say as a legal matter, it's facially discrimin discriminatory in the sense that only borrowers able to compensate commercial agents according to the judgment and terms of those agents benefit from the lower costs of private bank credit. In the interest of time, I'll leave aside shadow banks and the way they mimic bank finance. Again, they do that by expanding liquidity, by expanding what's called near, what scholars have called near money, if not money. And their impact is also selective, given the fact that only certain parties have access to the capital markets, both as lenders and as borrowers. So here to the question of justification, what I try to do here is um, suggest that uh, neither the history nor the theory justifies the role of banks as retailers of money. The history is, in my view, eye-opening. Commercial banks in the modern vein, that is banks that offer credit that passes for money at the retail level, began when businesses in Britain and the US started using credit as a stand-in for money. The problem was money shortage at the retail level. Businesses had to pay workers, workers had to pay rent, shops had to have a medium to sell uh, everyday items. And the solution was to deploy private credit as money. So here's the logic. Uh, industrialists paid people in promises to pay, their own promises to pay. Workers handed on those promises to pay for rent, for example, landlords, used those promises to pay at shops. Shops handed back those promises to pay to industrialists in exchange for goods or supplies. So this loop is obviously just one example. Many, uh, there are many ways that private credit could do the work of money when it's circulated among people with reciprocal obligations. The strategy could be carried out directly by businesses, um, established business families. It could be carried out indirectly by associations they created. Naomi Lamoureux is a um, historian of early banking in the United States. She dubs American banks investor lenders because they lent to those who owned them. That is, these associations were owned by industrialists. 
Uh, but she doesn't call out the fact that the way they're lending is by their own credit, right? Their own promises to pay, which is the emphasis here is looking at how we can create those, those um, families were creating money out of their own promises to pay. Of course, banks could also hold the savings of individuals and they would increasingly over the 19th century, but not so much the beginning when nobody had capital to save. Um, so the paper then talks a bit about the fact that money shortages had occurred before. Money substitutes often took the form of credit. I just overheard you talking a bit about local currencies, which are often generally a form of credit. Um, so the issue is what made this different? What converted these money substitutes into a form um, of retail money that spread so dominantly and that lasted? Um, it appears that the answer is the public architecture of money in both Britain and the United States. So again, we can kind of think of it this way. We had this system, right? These regional banks coming of age, creating, um, issuing private credit that could be used in their communities. And then those uh, a series of contextual institutional factors integrated that creation of de facto money with so the sovereign money supply. So really integrated it into um, the formal economy. So I'm happy to talk about the details if you're interested in the, in, after the, you know, in the Q&A, the discussion part. Um, in Britain, a national bank of issue, the Bank of England anchored sovereign money creation, brokers translated regional credit into sovereign, the sovereign money supply regularly. In the US, state governments assimilated private bank uh, money into de facto state currencies. A lot of this I'm still just piecing together and I, I think probably I'll take out this big piece of the paper and, and, and put it somewhere separate, but it's clear that state governments were accepting um, bank monies for taxes often. They held back on redeeming those taxes. So they're really not running a coin economy. They're supporting a bank economy. They borrow from banks and pay back the banks in their own, in the bank's own notes, for example. And communities also treated private bank notes uh, as money, including with norms against cashing them for, for coin, which would have crashed the system. So the whole arrangement is fascinating, enterprising, really pretty, pretty brilliant in my view. Uh, and it has a very powerful impact, right? Uh, it institutionalizes retail banking, but it doesn't go to the ability of banks to choose borrowers that most fairly disseminate the expanding public money supply nor does it particularly justify that role. It's ingenious, right? It's entrepreneurial opportunism. When we look to the theory for help, we also come up short. Uh, in the United States, to take that to, so I can just narrow to that point, um, the federal government re-enters the monetary arena at the Civil War. It invites and then coerces state banks to swap their charters for federal ones. It does that because it needs the banking machinery for money creation to fight the civil war, to fund the government. Expertise in credit allocation, which is what we're talking about now, right? What is supposed to justify the banking system is not a priority. In fact, the National Banking Act is tone deaf to fair credit allocation. Um, despite that neglect, banking is increasingly conceptualized to claim expertise in credit allocation, right? The allocation of a presumptively existing resource that is capital and to exclude or obscure money creation. That is the creation of capital in the first place. In the second half of the 19th century, theorists articulate modern retail banking as intermediation along these lines, right? Not money creation. How do they get to intermediation? They emphasize the command of banks over credit as purchasing power. They equate purchasing power with capital, again, as that sort of math, uh, mass of resources accumulated. Um, and then they argue that banks must occur where liquid capital has been accumulated, right? That's where banks come to, to arise, not, um, not as money creators. If they, if they emerge, as is true in their story, um, where liquid capital is abundant, then they exist to move liquid capital, right? From savers to borrowers. They're intermediaries, that is specialists at taking money from savers and lending it to the correct borrowers. So experts in money creation, right? And I'm uh, sorry, in um, credit allocation. Um, 
that is, they are actually flipping the history emphatically, not money creation, right? Um, they're saying, rather than producing growth by producing liquidity, banks are instead accessories to already accumulated capital. They come later and naturally out of, uh, out of capitalism. Um, and at that, that point, they produce growth by transferring existing capital from savers to borrowers. Banks become, um, become these institutions, and indeed, by the late 19th century, they resemble those institutions more simply because there's more capital created by banks during the course of the century. Modern retail banking is soon given a fictional history, a conjectural history, as one commentator puts it. The fictional history ties modern banks of issue to medieval merchant banks, and in that way endows bankers with the kind of legendary expertise of that group. More, it means that if banking has been evolving this way, you can equate the practice of banking with a kind of organic development, uh, one that represents an evolution towards best practices. And neoclassical thought assumes that lineage, dropping out public authority to expand the money supply. Indeed, there's no effort, right? So in the evolutionary story, we don't need the public. We don't need to understand how the public is supporting banks. Um, and there's no effort to step back and evaluate the kind of lending that banks are doing <laughs> against other possibilities. So money creation uh, in this mode by private actors operating for profit is pervasive. All public spending uh, and all private spending occurs within the system in this point in the modern world, in the modern United States anyway. Public spending that is fiscal policy consolidates the financial architecture. Here you can see I was coming back, you know, sort of constantly <laughs> informed by the COVID crisis. Um, public spending expands the balance of the architecture. So Congress borrows from banks by way of bonds. Bonds furnish investment vehicles to the wealthy. Bonds also anchor the capital market. That's true, uh, especially in times of crisis. The government stands behind the infrastructure that it's built. Um, it has to support the circuit it's built. That's the mandate, basically, of central banks. Um, so then, then what the where I conclude is to say, how might we begin to act given the entrenched nature of our system and its limited legitimacy? And this really came out of seeing everyone sort of trying to think of reform proposals in the middle of COVID, but rooting all of those spending proposals through the existing architecture. So the third, the third part of the third aim in the paper is to um, suggest a reform that, that would operate outside of finance. And here the idea is that we should experiment using a kind of money we've used before. Um, the direct issue dollar, this strategy would distill the definition of the dollar to a core. So we saw this, this is the way actually the modern system works where all money is rooted through banks. And all I was doing in the paper and love to hear your comments on was suggesting this, right? That we go back to a more transparent form of tax anticipation currency, right? Take out the financial interference, return to basics. The cash dollar, as we saw, is an IOU, a sovereign IOU, holds a certain amount of value to pay your taxes. It holds an additional premium when we look at it you know, empirically because it provides services as money. When we choose to do fiscal stimulus, instead of borrowing by way of bond and then um, taking the money, we could instead, as, that is instead of borrowing with long by long-term bond, we could issue it directly to people the way the US spent the greenback, treasury bills earlier in the 19th century, bills of credit during the colonial period, all based on the same theory. Um, if we did that, we could, uh, we could support the well-being of populations the people were reaching without rooting the outlay of public money through the existing financial hardwiring. So just three key features of this reform proposal of three key features of direct issue money, and then I'll be done. Um, first, direct issue dollars would avoid increasing long-term debt. So the IMF recently reported on increases in long-term debt, both public and private, globally, public debt jumped to an average of 100% um, of GDP for each nation, 
an astonishing result that occurred as government stepped in to support their people and communities devastated by COVID. That debt is becoming daily harder to manage. A lot of it is dollar denominated. A lot of it's borrowed from, um, from, uh, from American investors, but all, even that that's not is borrowed in the dollar. As the Fed raises its interest rates, that, that, that debt becomes harder to, to roll over and maintain. By contrast, direct issue dollars used here or direct issue money used in other countries would allow spending that did not extend, expand uh, existing long-term debt. At the same time, that lending would remain keyed to demand. Direct issue dollars could be withdrawn by taxation transparently. Second feature of, um, of direct issue money, so it wouldn't uh, expand long-term existing long-term debt, it would be issued by Congress, a democratically accountable body. So as a politically democratic, uh, a politically accountable body, um, Congress could target needy populations for those deserving funds, which it did, tried to do during the COVID crisis. Compare here monetary finance. Monetary finance is the other way we currently finance public spending outside of the stricture of taking on long-term debt. So the Fed can always buy existing public debt and expand the money supply as it does so. And it does that in recessionary times uh, at, at times. But that kind of support for the economy enters diffusely. It's not targeted to those who, who need it most. And that's partly because the, the judge, the central bank is not democratically accountable. So it feels that it can only operate diffusely, right? Uh, by generally expanding the money supply, it doesn't target spending. By contrast, direct issue dollars would be a form of public spending initiated by Congress and could be targeted effectively by Congress. Third point, the strategy could be safeguarded by the Fed itself. So legislative issue of money raises alarms for many people, maybe for some of you. Uh, central bank independence is understood as necessary to prevent partisan manipulation of the money supply. Um, there's a strong intuition that legislatures would abuse monetary power, right? Money creation power by increasing the money supply when they're in office uh, in order to um, maintain, you know, public spending, say, underneath in, within their tenure. Um, so that tuition remains entrenched despite the fact that legislative issue worked in the 19th century UK and US very well, very quite transparently over issue. The German hyperinflation, for example, Zimbabwe appears to occur more often through the executive branch manipulation of the money supply, often by using central banks as an instrument, maybe because it's all less transparent than when legislatures do it. In any case, even if that intuition is correct, legislative issue could be safeguarded today by the Fed. So the proposal would put the central bank into a whole new role, or more accurately, it invokes the Fed to deploy its existing power in a new way, which is um, saying that the Fed could continue to safeguard the stability of the system that included direct issue dollars while allowing this democratic influence on the system, right? The Fed could continue to modulate the money supply and, and just the same as if direct issue dollars weren't part of that mix. What direct issue dollars do, I think, is expose money creation as a public responsibility. So in that sense, the pitch, the reform pitch is really more a plea um, asking us to take responsibility for the monetary hardwiring, it needs redesign. I don't think we can run a democracy without that redesign, which really brings me full circle, I think, to, um, to the goals that you espouse um, so effectively and, uh, and where I started the talk, which is um, the goal and importance of popular knowledge. Uh, we need to build it at a foundational level um, and we need to use that knowledge uh, and this could be one way, at least one step or one experiment to that end. Thank you, Professor Dasalan. Uh, it, it's so exciting to know that a discussion of uh, direct issue money uh, is happening um, at your level, lofty level. Um, and <laughs> I, I, I'm not- At least one of us is talking about it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yes. And I'm not meaning that facetiously. I really, you're at the pinnacle of the academic world. So it's it's exciting for us to um, have your voice there. Uh, our plan now is to break into um, the uh, rooms uh, for about 15 minutes so people can kind of digest and then we'll come back and at that point we'll have questions directly for you. All right, we're back. Um, I was lucky enough to be in, um, Christine was in our group, so we had an extra treat and we're ready to start answering questions or um, ha have feedback from what you got out of your group and questions you'd like to ask. Sam, it looks like you are at the top of the list. Go ahead. Christine, thank you so much for your work, uh, for the paper, for this presentation. Um, I wanted to know what kind of response you've gotten and in particular, what kind of engagement with the, the actual, you know, kind of power apparatus of the United States policy uh, world? We were just talking about this. It's such a great question and it's such a hard question, uh, or it's an easy question in a sense. I feel like I'm still outside knocking on the door, right? Uh, I, I, I have gotten a fair amount of engagement at the academic level. Um, I was I was saying to your to your colleagues. Uh, I've presented this to my faculty. I've actually also pre presented it to a number of other faculties to a conference on central banking. Um, uh, depending on how generalized the audience is, sometimes if it's a very generalized audience, you know, half the people may not get it, right? I mean, might not get the, it, it, it turns out to be a dense thing to try to understand the hard wiring. Um, and uh, so sometimes I don't get very far on that score. Um, I do, I have gotten, you know, interest and polite engagement. I think academics are talking about, about this and other reform proposals, particularly there are some reform proposals that have gotten much farther than this. So Fed accounts, um, narrow banking, uh, you know, they're from different, um, different sides of the spectrum. Uh, I, I think it's an, it's an, it's another bridge, right? It's a bridge far, it's a farther bridge to actually get into the policy to affect the policy world. Um, so I, I don't feel that I've affected the policy world so far. I think I've, I've, you know, been chipping away at the discourse. Um, the, the other, another example of that is Virginia mentioned at the outset that I'm in on the public, on a public bank, um, initiative in, a part of a group in Massachusetts, we filed legislation, we actually got pretty far. I mean, in some ways, maybe the state level has some more openness than, than the federal level does. But again, you get pretty far, but, but actually getting over the hurdle at the end, uh, um, given the resistance of the financial industry, that, that's a whole nother challenge, right? So I think that's going to take us, that's going to take um, a longer by time. <laughs> the hurdle, by the hurdle at the end, do you mean actually getting a bank that has access to the Federal Reserve payment system? Yes. So the so the the, the Massachusetts legislation was um, to have a state-run bank that had state revenues in it and did lending. It wasn't a retail bank for individuals, but a state a state-run bank with state deposits that would be have membership in the Federal Reserve. And just so I'm clear, is it is it getting access and participation in the Federal Reserve system that's the hold up like the Federal Reserve not uh, no, no 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 it's it, I wish we were that far it's getting okay. through the Massachusetts legislature so I haven't okay. given up at all but but in terms of your your question I think is such a uh, appropriate question is you know how far can you get policy wise so you know it, it we have to go back to the Massachusetts legislature, keep making our case, hope to get legislation from them. We've drafted legislation that's filed, we got sponsors, we got pretty far, but actually getting passed, enacted by the state is what I would look for, right? That's what, that's obvious was our goal. And that's still ahead of us. Thank you so much. Over, it's your Yes, thank you, Dr. Tassan. That was a very uh, interesting and great uh, um, 
shortening of your paper, which is about 70 pages of, of good legal uh, uh, work, which, uh, you know, we, we talked amongst ourselves and it's really work to, to get through it. So I'm very glad that you gave a nice overview there. One of the things that, that stood out for me, um, and that's something I, I like to learn from you. So there is the say-so story, of course, of the goldsmith uh, as, the, as the origination of banking. Uh, the goldsmith, it, you know, people uh, deposit gold with them. They give a gold certificate. Uh, suddenly they find out they can write fake uh, gold certificates and in that way somehow banking came into uh, 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 into existence and there is some possibility to that story but since reading Graeber um, I always thought like it, it there probably is something of a credit mechanism that then transformed into uh, uh, modern banking and you were alluding to that that you had a, a local credit circle going which then expanded and then got melded with the state uh, uh, um, system and i think that's also something um jeffrey ingham uh, he's a sociologist of money uh, from the uk um, he, he looked into that so my specific question to you is can you give us a simple story, as simple as the uh, the say-so story of the goldsmith about how this banking system came into being so that we have something of a tool to tell others how that actually happens without coming with, with a quasi mythic um, story? That's my question. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for the question of, uh, I've presented this, as I said, several times and nobody ever asks me about the history so much so and it's so long and so this is a real question for all of you um i've kind of become convinced i should take the history out and put it as a separate paper um because i think uh by the time people get there perhaps it's just too <laughs> difficult <laughs> to get through and too much at odds with the policy momentum of the of the paper so i'll just throw that out there i you know any responses or thoughts you had if you just email me i'll, I'll appreciate them because i'm at the moment of sort of thinking of of revising the paper in a way that separates those two halves. Um, and I guess that would give me more time and space and, and hopefully an audience who wasn't too tired by the time they got to the history to actually think think about the history, um, which you did, as I said, is, a, is literally the first question I've ever gotten about the history, even though I, in, in some ways, thought that was the heart of the paper uh, when I wrote it. Um, so I think it's exactly right that we need to tell a counter story. As far as I know, there is a counter story. I'm still relatively early days in trying to put it together. Um, but the Goldsmith Banks, for example, it looks pretty clear. I'm now blanking on the name Temen, Peter Temen, and a co author wrote a book showing that those institutions went out of business in the early 18th century. The, our, the lineage really doesn't go back. Our modern banking lineage really doesn't go back to them. They didn't, they didn't then fill in the gap. Um, I think the story is really making money substitutes, that it really is a story of big industrial families or manufacturing families or business families, or even not so big, creating, using their own credit within a community and using their own credit in ways that will come back to them so that, uh, so that they can create a lot of credit and move a lot of goods, right? Have a lot of economic exchange without actually needing to, um, to use that much the official unit of account. Having said that, the difference between this world, I mean, as, as, you, as you probably know, you know, there've been many attempts to make money substitutes and there are many local currencies. And the question is, why did this one take off? And, and I think that's the key question. And maybe that's harder to tell in a short, just so story, but the, but the, the, the quick answer is that this money substitute became integrated into the national payment system. So this money substitute, unlike other ones, was um, assimilated into the ongoing sort of the circulation from the center in the Bank of England, or in the case of state U.S. state governments, in the state government, you know, it was assimilated by state governments um, as a real money, as the money that they had to use. And again, that's, 
I have to work on getting it simpler, but at first I have to, as many of these things, you can't say them simply until you understand them more in a, <laughs> better uh -huh. than, I, than I do. So um, I'm very interested in trying to figure out how these institutions are getting their footing and how, unlike other money substitutes or complementary currencies or local currencies, they actually get built into the official system. I think that's the key, right? That's the difference. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to your to your research. That's for sure. And yeah, you you are familiar then with the Jeffrey Ingham. Uh, yes, work. I am. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 I thought it was brilliant because he put sociology with history with uh, economics yeah. and and uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Stephen. You're on mute. You're muted. Thank you, Professor Desan, for being here. And I had a great time in, in Harvard, and I, I look forward to possibly being there in June. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, just a few comments. I see somebody else has a question who might ask about the uh, coining and the borrowing clause, clauses. So I'm going to let, I'm, I'm going to skip that. Uh, our group really liked the way you presented of what money is and how it affects society. And they felt there was a lot of strength there. And um, it says I might be, I need to further unmute, but anyhow. And then, um, but the, the uh, we're left with some circles circling around trying to figure a bit thinking about if you have that plain government issuing of money and then also concurrently having a bank money uh, where banks are creating um, credit, turning it into a purchasing medium, and that would be the side-by-side -side competition model perhaps. And um, is do you have, could that be inflationary? Do you have thoughts in that regard? That was one of the questions our group had. Thank you. So we also talked about inflation. Uh, I made one pitch there and I'll, I'll, I'll make that pitch again and then um, add another, uh, another possibility. Uh, first of all, I would acknowledge that inflation is a difficult issue and it's a tricky issue. We don't always understand all the causes of inflation. Um, and all the cures and remedies for it. One thing that makes me more optimistic about a direct issue system is that in the past when they have been used, there's been a lot of public knowledge and transparency about the issue of money and its retirement by the government. So a lot of debate about the fiscal um, undergirding of money and how it should be and how taxation should be deployed. And the civil war is the obvious example of this, that this in the South where taxation fell apart and where there was no real government credibility um, for the, the enterprise on which people were, were launched and for the monetary system, there was 9,000% inflation. And for the North, which also used a tax anticipation direct issue dollar, there was 150% inflation, which for wartime is actually not bad at all. So the, the North, and there's a lot of debate in the, and a lot of, um, as I said, sort of public education about inflation and about the difficulties of, um, of running the money, the money system. So that makes me more optimistic. The other thing I would just mention in passing um, is that, to add to that, uh, is that the proposal, I was really well into the proposal before realizing that the Fed, the proposal makes no uh, effort to dismantle the Fed, right? to say we shouldn't have the Fed. Um, the Fed's gonna be there for all of our lifetimes. And, and, and the Fed would have the same mandate it has now. Nothing about this proposal changes the mandate of the Fed, which is to police for inflation in whatever ways it does. So, um, so that would be by raising interest rates, um, um, by contracting, you know, by selling bonds and contracting the money supply or, um, or for that matter, Congress could also tax. But, but I, I guess I would just say, I don't see it as more difficult I, while, I'm, while acknowledging that inflation is a difficult issue. It doesn't seem to me more difficult or more inflationary than, uh, than the current system. We'd still have the same tools and we to use to counter inflation and possibly we'd have more public knowledge, transparency, 
debate and education over what money is and how it should be managed. Okay. Yeah, the, the question would be, would there be alternative ways around um, bank money and, and um, getting away from it a little bit more than when, than when we have it today too? And, and there's all sorts of ideas, like even a public institution that hands out mm -hmm. mortgages mm -hmm. as part mm -hmm. of a, a government funding system. Yeah, you know, so I think, to, yeah, I, I think I would just, uh, I would agree with that, with those kind of suggestions. That is to say, I would hope that once we had opened up the system, we could have a debate about different ways of diffusing credit into circulation. That it's not just direct issue dollars, but as in the colonial era, you know, those were basically mortgage-based land banks land banks that worked on the basis of mortgages. So you could um, certainly imagine, and I would hope this would, in, you know, the, the more we move in this area, right, if we can get from, from the academy to, to policy, we could open up more creativity of that type. Thank you. Nick. You're muted, Nick. Ah. <laughs> Dr. DeSan, that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, you, were, you were here for us today. If, if I can just make a pitch to you maybe, and that's to look upon money as a power, uh, this tremendous power, perhaps the greatest power in our society. So one thing we all need to survive, you can't survive in society without money. And, uh, we look at it as I'm American Monetary Institute uh, with, within the framework of the NEED Act. Are you familiar with that at all? Or the legislation that uh, Dennis Kucinich and uh, John Conyers put into Congress in 2011, National Employment Emergency Defense Act. And uh, you can just Google NEED Act, you'll be able to find it. And, and, and uh, we look at it as, as three reforms that have to happen to bring us to a sane money system that works for the people that can tackle these tremendous problems we have, such as uh, another COVID crisis, such as climate change, such as destroying our oceans and fresh water, uh, you, you name it. You know, we've got problems. We don't even know what the, the, what, what the future holds for. But the three things are, number one is, Stop banks from creating money. Government creates money. And the Federal Reserve System is basically stripped down and put into the Department of Treasury. So it becomes part of our government. Uh, those, are, those are the three reforms. And, and looking upon that as a power, you know, I, I, I have... Uh, <laughs> I have a book coming out, and then I have another one coming out right after because it was all too long and I decided to put it into three books. But the one that's coming out is Money Creation 101. When I was in college a long time ago, we were told that we would skip the chapter on the Federal Reserve System and the creation of money because only a couple of people in the country are smart enough to understand it, <clears throat> how it works. Now think about that. The most necessary thing we have in our society, and we're to, and I've told people this story, and they, oh yeah, yeah, that same thing happened to me, or something similar, that we couldn't understand it. The most important thing in our society, and we're told we're too dumb to understand it. And why are we too dumb to understand it? Because they made such a convoluted system about how it actually works that we can't even pin the Federal Federal Reserve down right now to tell us how our money is created. I sent uh, emails to a bunch of Federal Reserve macroeconomists. And one of them responded. He was very nice, cordial, and everything. And, and, and he said, well, well, we'll have to go to the public relations department at the Federal Reserve for them to tell you how the money's created. I, I mean, that's, that's crazy. Then I sent letters to economists at our top economics programs in the country. And two of them responded. It 
I surprised me. I didn't think anybody would respond. The reason I sent them is because people that had read my book, that I had some beta readers I was having read the book, they, they said, well, we want to hear somebody that doesn't agree to you, agree with you. You know, we want to hear from the other side because I'm not presenting the other side. That's all we've had. I mean, I do present the other side, but I don't present it favorably. And uh, so I sent it out to over 100 uh, uh, professors at top economics programs. Two of them commented. One of them said, my best guess is it's the fractional reserve method. Now think about that. This guy was ahead of his department. My best guess is that our money is created by the fractional reserve system. And the other one was just very kind of disdainful for me. He, he, didn't, he didn't really answer, but he sent me a paper by somebody that was talking about the Federal Reserve creating money and nothing about banks creating money. But this is such a, a, a tremendous power. And uh, so they're going to fight us. The, they are going to fight us. That's why we have to say, this is what we want. We want government created money. We don't want bank created money. We want to stop that. And we want the federal reserve system to become part of the federal government. Anyway, uh, uh, that's about it. Now the need act has been updated by the uh, Alliance for, for just money. Uh, just just recently, it's it's online at their website, the American Monetary Reform Act of 2022, which puts it in a little more understandable language and updates some of the things. You know, just the situation we're at right now versus where we were when, when it was written. I thank you again for your presentation. I'm gonna. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I, I mean, you can't do the job that I've had for the last couple of decades without uh, running all the time into um, into the conventional story that we don't have to understand money or it's too complicated or we should skip that chapter. So that's that um, really rings familiar to me. And I think um, I think we also agree on the fact that you know once we figure out how money works, then the question is how we would want to redesign and reform the system. I, I, before Richard, I've handed over to Richard to ask a question I know he's going to ask, and I'm looking forward to your answering it. Um, I just wanted to put in a plug for my presentation tomorrow at 2.30, uh, following um, Nick's uh, uh, recommendation of reading the NEED Act. What we're going to look at tomorrow is some remaining issues that are not clear in either the NEED Act or AMRA, and that we have an opportunity to step back and look at with fresh eyes, given how much more we've learned in the last 10 years. And I hope all of you will join me for that presentation. And go ahead with your question, Richard. Okay, thank you, Virginia. Yes, uh, excellent uh, uh, talk, Professor. I appreciate it. Um, we, uh, Nick mentioned the uh, the need act in the amra and title three of that act uh calls for the treasury department to uh to issue what what you call treasure um, direct issue dollars and the need act calls it uh united states money or treasury direct dollars um, do you recommend that that power reside in the congress or uh with the executive branch I, I think you said the executive branch is where abuse tends to happen uh, in Germany or Zim, Zimbabwe, I think you mentioned. Uh, do you have a, an opinion on that? Yeah, so I would never give the executive branch the power of money creation full stop, which doesn't mean that Treasury shouldn't be ah. the department from which the dollars issue, because the Treasury would be acting at the behest of Congress in my in my scheme, but Congress has the power to appropriate in our system, and uh, uh, and I think we should preserve that power to Congress. I can't imagine that we'd want to dismantle or relocate Congress's control over the public fist to the executive branch. This was really what set the American experience apart from the British in the 18th century. So, so where I, when I came of age constitutionally was in studying the way legislatures got their power in the 18th century and how they resisted monarchical rule. And that power came from, I agree with the idea that money is power, that power came from relocating literally 
the receiver generals of the governors, the imperial governors, to their own um, to their own branch. The treasurers became then treasury became a legislative yeah. a part of the legislative of the provincial legislatures, um, and and it's that and that's at the root of Congress's power to appropriate, and in particular the House's power to initiate spending bills. So I I would not dismantle that because I think that would be putting too much power in executive hands. It doesn't mean that the Treasury Department should not, through our administrative um, law, actually be following the dictates of Congress. That's ultimately the theory of the administrative state is that Congress is directing the administrative state and that the executive power is implementing with some you know, discretionary um, latitude uh, um, Congress's dictates. So I would stick with that. And that's certainly my instinct. Good to hear that. Uh, just one other point. Uh, some people recommend uh, a fourth branch of government, but you would, I think uh, you would disagree with that also, I, I assume. Uh, a fourth monetary bran a branch for monetary. Yeah, a fourth branch for the monetary system. For the monetary authority. Uh, well, I, I'd have to look at that. It, it doesn't strike me intuitively as the, <laughs> the right way to go, but I haven't seen the, right. I haven't seen those proposals. Great. Thank you. All right, Franz. You're muted, Franz. <laughs> You're still we, muted. We all are aware that the Federal Reserve Act basically uh, 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 has two objectives, employment, sometimes they say full employment. My question to you is this, given the emergency of the climate, should it not be a good idea to have a third monetary mandate besides price stability and employment of decarbonization? So, and that every state can do this. And then as an extension of that, when states are going to do this, then they will come hopefully to the conclusion that it would make sense of having the international monetary system be based upon a monetary standard of decarbonization and optimal solarization. So I was wondering what your opinion is in those two cases. Yeah, so my understanding is that most central banks are ahead of the Fed in terms of taking into account climate change and the risks it produces and thinking of that as part of their mandate, which is interesting given that some of them are only price stability, not even full employment as explicit mandates. If we could politically um, attain a third mandate that was um, to ameliorate climate change, however, however that is, I'm no, not an expert in how that would be done, but. Uh, I think it would be ideal to have a third mandate in the act. The question, it seems to me, since I see no prospect of that happening anytime soon, given our democratic dysfunctionality, um, I think the question becomes, could the Fed or how far should the Fed move now, assuming that the risks and devastation created by climate change affect employment and affect price stability, how far should the Fed already, you know, with only a dual mandate, move um, in the present day? And my own, uh, from my own knowledge of the climate situation, it's uh, um, abundantly clear that if that if central banks, along with other institutions of government, don't start acting now to take steps that address climate change, we will have no full employment, we will have no price stability. So just thinking in terms of bank risk and regulation, it seems to me that there's a very strong case to be made that the Fed already should be acting just as a matter of protecting the economy, not even thinking of this as a progressive issue, but as a matter of, of protection of the economy, which is ultimately a protection of the, of the natural world, the globe that we have. 
So that's where I am on that issue. I think there's gonna be a lot of interesting work and, and emphasis on this for just the reasons that you say. It's a, um, an existential crisis, it seems to me. What about making this, uh, this decarbonization or optimal solarization a monetary standard on the international level so that you would have a, uh, a so that nations would decide on a specific total of CO2, tonnage of CO2 per person, which like on, on state level would also reflect on their, on the, on their, on, on their uh, monetary, financial, fiscal and commercial position in the world. I wouldn't disagree with that. I just don't know how we do it, right? That is to say, there doesn't seem to me to be the international organization that has the clout and the political facility to get there. It, and that seems to me tragic, right? I mean, we obviously need to coordinate at the international level, at the global level. And it is also obvious for all the reasons that, that we've been talking about that the monetary dimension is huge, that it's a dimension of governance and that we can't leave it out as some kind of technical other, um, other sphere while we're working on these uh, extremely important issues. I just don't know what the organ is that would get us there. It doesn't seem to be the IMF. Uh, it's, you know, it would never get through the, the, the uh, UN as far as I know, so. So, to, so, so I think Gabriel also- I think we we're, we're, we're going to have to wrap up right now, Franz. Um, and I want very much to thank you, uh, Professor Desson, for being here. I think it's been a rich and engaging conversation. And I'll pass it on to Stephen. To... Thank you. I really appreciated it. Thank you, Professor Desson.